Welcome to Africa's Biggest Braai. I'm Zain Nabi, and you're listening to the On The Whistle podcast. Today, we have one of the most successful CEOs in South African football joining us. A big and very warm welcome to Supersport United exec, Stanley Matthews. Stanley, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Uh, good, thanks, Zane. Thanks for having me, and thanks to you and Courtney. No worries. And you've mentioned my left-back, right-back, centre-back partner, as always, I have former PSL winner Courtney Fries with me. Courtney, good sir, good man. How are you doing? I'm fantastic today, Zane. As I said to you before, um, loving where I am at the moment. Lovely weather, overcast, raining, no mosquitoes, no flies. Very happy. The only man I know that will long for no sunshine, Courtney Fries. Well, guys, we're going to get the podcast underway. But just before we do, I'm going to give us a quick plug. Do like and subscribe if you're watching the show on YouTube or listening on a podcast platform, wherever you get it from. Spotify, Google, wherever you like, subscribe. We also love hearing from you. So don't be afraid to leave a comment or post on our social media accounts. Just to remind you, you can find us at OTW underscore podcast on Twitter and Instagram and on Facebook or YouTube at the On The Whistle podcast. To get things going though, I'm going to tee you up, Courtney. Kick us off, over to you, mate. Let's get this party started. So, Stanley, thank you once again. I was just wanting to ask you, our first CEO that we've ever had on, on the worst. So we're very grateful to have you, uh, your presence today. So how did you get into football ownership as well as become the CEO of Supersport United? Yeah, look, I've, I've been at the club um, a long time, uh, 22 years now. So I wasn't always the chief executive officer. I've served a few different roles. Um, I was a team manager at one stage. I was the director of football at another stage. Um, so I only really became CEO at Supersport United in 2012. So for the last 10 years um, in, in that capacity. Um, and at, at our club, we've got a very close-knit family. Um, we, I'd say probably 70% of my staff have been with me between 15 and 20 years. So there's not a high turnover of staff at Supersport. My head coach, Keitano Tembo, uh, came to the club in 1999 as a player and has never left. So he's in his 23rd year at, at the club. Um, so these type of, of long relationships that we've had, um, my head of recruitment and welfare, Godfrey Mosetsu, has been in my academy for 21 years. Um, a lot of the backroom staff, as I say, have been at the club all that time. So we've got a good family unit. We understand each other well. We complement each other. There's not a lot of politics and infighting at the club. Um, and that makes a big difference, um, you know, that we pull together and we've managed to be consistent. I think that togetherness of the staff really has been the, the foundation of our 22 consecutive top eight finishes. Um, in the league, which is a record, uh, which we're proud of, um, which isn't so easy to, to achieve, you know. Um, but we've managed to do that. And I think testimony to the fact that we've got such consistency in the backroom staff. We've won trophies with six of the last seven coaches we've worked with. So it's not just that one coach brought something, you know. Pizzo brought a certain specialness. Um, Gavin brought his own uniqueness in terms of the three consecutive league championships. But since then, we've won trophies also with um, Gordon Negerson, with Stuart Baxter, with Eric Tinkler, and with Keitano himself. So, you know, to be um, successful with six different coaches, um, it talks to the good support we've had from Supersport themselves and the continuity we've had within the team. What are your targets for Supersport, the first team for this current season? 20 games in, potentially 11 to 12 games to go. What are your targets? Look, we, we, we're in a situation now where we can't win the league. Um, so that now we have to say, how high can we finish? Uh, realistically, on the one hand, we obviously want to keep our top eight run going. We'd love to have a top four finish. On the other hand, we don't have the depth of squad to be able to be masters of everything. And 
We're currently in the quarterfinals of the Ned Bank. Um, we've shown, certainly over the last eight, nine years, that our cup pedigree still remains very, very strong. We, I mean, we haven't finished in the top four in the league since 2012. So, you know, we haven't had a top four league finish in 10 years. But in that time, we've won six trophies in terms of cup finals. Um, we've made a Confederation Cup final. We've made five other cup finals that we've lost in. So, you know, outside of Sundowns, there's no team in South Africa that's got that kind of pedigree. Uh, I mean, Chiefs have won no trophies in eight years. Pirates have won one trophy in eight years. And we've won six trophies in that time. So only Sundowns can strut with their chests out a little bit uh, bigger than us in terms of that kind of record. And being faced with the quarterfinals now, um, we're two games away from a big day for the club. Um, and, you know, will that impact our league form? Probably, because uh, we, we don't have it, it within us to field like a second 11 like Sundowns can do. Um, you know, some of the other squads that the teams are running with 35, uh, 38 players. I've got a squad of 27 players. I've got some players like Bradley Krobler out for the rest of the season. Um, you know, with surgery. And he was my leading goal scorer last year, which is a big, big loss and a blow to us. Um, and, I'm, and I've got a lot of youngsters all over the park, um, you know, that, that are still learning you know last night we had um our winning goal scored by russell Botch, a young lad from the academy um you know he's probably playing his seventh or eighth game for the club and so his career is only just starting is far from being a seasoned professional or you know somebody that um we can rely on week in and week out for that consistency but we we're in that situation now where that's what we have to draw on. Jamie Weber was suspended. And, and it's ironic also, you know, if Jamie wasn't suspended, Russell Butcher wouldn't have played. And if you're not playing, you can't score the winning goal. So, you know, it's, uh, we, we're taking that view now in the club that everything's an opportunity for learning and growth and development because we've got a good young team. And if we invest time in them, yeah. Yeah, if, we, if we give them the time, if we give them the platform, if, we, if we're patient and understand they are going to lose, um, you know, matches against Maritzburg away. They are going to, you know, throw points away against Royal AM. They, they're going to do that because they're still learning their way in the game. But the investment down the line um, pays huge dividends. You know, you look at a player, we've got a player now, Keegan Johannes, just brought him in um, a few months ago. And he's 20 years old. Um, but you can already see that this kid is, he's like, you know, Clayton Daniels on steroids. And, and uh, we all know that Clayton, you know, served a fantastic uh, career in South Africa. Um, he played for Sundowns, he played for us, he's won lots of trophies. He captained Bloemfontein Celtic, he captained our club. Um, he had a really good career. And, um, he played for the national team. So he, he lived a lot of young men's dreams, Clayton. And when I see young Keegan Johannes, I see just the start. And you look at Luke Fleurs, you see just the start. These, these boys are 20 years old. As centre backs go, they've got 15, 16 years still to go. I was going to say, Stan, it sounds like there's so much potential in the super sport team, and the future certainly looks bright. Um, Unbelievable. I mean, if we just bring it back to the present, it seems like it's pretty impossible to stop sundowns and their dominance in South Africa, their competitiveness in Africa. What has to change to, to, to really um, make the league more competitive in, in, in your opinion? I think, I think it's what we're going through now is something, if you look around the world, um, just since Manchester City had their new owners, the dominance that they have had in cup finals, in league, in, in a lot of um, the domestic game over the past couple of years has been about Manchester City and Liverpool. They have two slightly different models, um, but they're both heavyweights and Man City are super heavyweights. Now in, in, in South Africa now you have a sundown that can come and give us a record fee for Tobohomo Kuena. 
but he's not even certain to make their lineup. The previous record fee was for Aubrey Modiba, and he sits bench a lot of the time for Sundowns. Aubrey Modiba at me was some, the first name on the team sheet. Sure. And what are the numbers, numbers when you talk about these record fees? Because if I'm correct, the money that Sundowns can play is as attractive as playing in Europe, if I'm correct. Yeah, and hold on, I, mean, I remember the record fee for George Kumante Rakas being 500,000. That was a record fee at the time. I remember that. <laughs> Yeah, I broke. I actually broke the South African domestic record in 2000 when I bought Patrick Mayo from Bush Bucks, um, and I paid 800 grand for for Patrick, um, and it was a record. And, and and I remember also, you know, he was the record earner in the club, and I think his salary was 20,000 rand a month. Now you look today, and um, you know, not just us, but almost every club will have two, three players earning, you know, more than three million bucks a year. Um, Sundowns have probably got 15 players, uh, 20 players earning more than that a year. So, um, you know, they've, they've accelerated away from the pack um, by virtue of the fact that they have by far the, the most expensively assembled squad. You still have to do the business. You can spend a lot of money and uh, not win. Um, if you know what I mean. So it, it's, you have to have a lot of respect for what they've done. But with the depth that they have, with the, with the strength that they have to go and buy Peter Salalile, um, you know, from Highlands and to have a, a player like Mvala, Toby Mvala, would play every single game for me. He would be in the first name on my coach's uh, team sheet. He can't catch a game for Sundowns. So we are realistic about where we are in that space. We are not a sundowns and we are not going to be a sundowns. We want to stand for our own value system um, and we think we can make an impact in South African soccer in our unique way by building, continuing to build players. If it happens to be we're building players for sundowns, chiefs and pirates, that's also okay because uh, that's servicing South African football. Um, it's making an impact. Um, if we have a strong Bafana, then that's good for South African sport. It's good for South African soccer. And our brand is heavily invested in football. Um, the Supersport brand is, is um, pouring a lot of investment into South African soccer. Um, the, the DSTV Premiership, the DSTV Disky Challenge, the Showmax sponsorship of the referees. Um, you know, uh, we, 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 we're serious about South African football and, 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 and as a club, we need to carry that seriousness through um, by doing the right things, by being um, role models in certain ways. I, I like your holistic way of looking at the greater good of South African football. I think you have a really good mindset on that. Um, and for those of you listening out there internationally, when Stan mentioned 3 million rand, that's just under 200,000 US dollars. So it's a lot of money. You can see that there's a fair amount of money in South Africa's Premier Soccer League, and that's why it's the richest on the continent and one of the richest um, when you look at international leagues around the world. Um, Stan, I'm going to take you back. I'm going to put you in a time machine, and I'm going to take you back to the glory days of Super Sport. When you guys won the league, not once, not twice, but three successive times in a row in, um, what was that, 2008 to about 2010. Um, yeah. When you look at the success of that team, um, what is it that made Supersport create the dynasty? Because Sundowns were still spending money at that point. Chiefs and Pirates were Chiefs and Pirates. Um, and I'm intrigued to find out how you guys built that dynasty and were the um with the benchmark and standard bearers in south african football just as we went into the 2010 world cup i think first and foremost credit has to go to, to gavin hunt um as the lead technician of of those title winning seasons he was the architect behind it he and um, tommy Madakaki, late tommy um they were the guys that 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 molded that team into a very solid unit um, and got them believing in themselves, got them to be very hard to beat. And, um, you know, we, had, we were on momentum. It was almost miraculous from our side, you know. It was a lot of momentum uh, where we didn't really technically have the strongest or the best or the most expensive or any, on any metric, we weren't the most biggest or powerful 
squad, but we had a, a, a very good mentality and we had, we had good mentally tough people all at the same time. So, you know, guys like Bongani Kumalo, although he was young, um, had a great mental toughness and, 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 and tenacity and attitude. And his partnership with Ricardo Katza, um, who had that also toughness and Morgan Gould, that was uh, the pillar uh, of our success at the back. We were very difficult to break down. Um, you know, when you add Tabo September, when we did have injuries, he would just plug in and, 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 you know, be on top of it in that situation. So we had a very strong defensive uh, unit. We played um, pretty simple uh, structured football, you know, with, uh, with the wingers, with Palembe and with Clayt. Our recruitment was good. It, it, all the factors kind of fell into play at once and we had the right coach and also we gave him in terms of the board and certainly my chairman Kulu Sibir um, at the time said Gavin we've just come off the back of a lot of cups we had made five domestic cup finals on the spin under pizza and Kulu was hungry for league success and he said to Gavin I don't care about the cups I don't care if you get knocked out first round of every cup but I care about the league and I want you to try and win me a league championship and somehow, miraculously, we did it. We did it on the last day of, of the season in three consecutive years. Um, and it, it, the funny thing was, in all the time that we won, uh, we messed our lines on the last day of the season and still won the league. <laughs> we lost, we drew and we lost and we won the league all three times. So um, it, was, it was something very special. And... Um, it's unfortunate that we haven't been able to sustain that type of squad. You know, after that, um, the big guns came in. Pirates took a couple of our players. Chiefs took a couple of our players. And they went on to good things. Um, you know, Dane won two consecutive trebles at Pirates after he left us, um, as, lo as well as uh, Tandani Chumayelo, Chumayelo um, Bebo. They won uh, um, trophies with Pirates. Um, and then at Chiefs, when Chiefs won... Uh, two league championships in three seasons, I think, under Stuart Baxter. Um, we had George Maluleke there. We had Morgan Gould there. Um, we had Katleja Mpela there. Um, so we had Sibu Nisugaka there. So we, we, we made a, a, an impact. We had Katleja Mashecha also went to Pirates. Um, it was a very good goal scorer for us, uh, underrated player. So, you know, then... I think post 2012 13, certainly when Pizzo um, came in at Sundowns, um, you know, he went on, on a very, very aggressive campaign to wrap up the best players at Sundowns and then put them out on loan. Or, you know, but control and incubate that market. and think that it's your route to go and certainly the last five from, from the pack because they simply um, assembling superior players and it's, it's not a pathway that's open to you know to, to the rest of the, the clubs if it, it's, it's, it's an artificial economy because it's not based on increased crowd support it's not based on you know, increased commercial deals or anything like that. It's, it's, it's based on investor funding. And the other clubs can't afford to, to chase that uh, because we've got our grants, we've got our sponsorship, we've got, uh, uh, you know, our core revenue streams, sale of players, etc. But at the end of the day, we have to balance the books as, as football clubs. And um, there are very few teams that can be like a Chelsea or like a Man City or like a Sundowns where you can kind of have a Real Madrid approach to, to assembling a, a, a team of Galacticos. Um, we, we have to try our balls and be something different. We're very proud, um, honestly, genuinely very proud of what Sundowns have built on the continent. Um, that, you know, Sundowns beat al Ahly. Um, for me as a South African football uh, loving person and a football administrator, in the game, I'm happy and I'm proud, and I want Sundowns to get another gold star. I want, you know, Pirates and Chiefs also to do well. We want our big clubs to shine on the continent. It's, you know, we don't see ourselves as 
competing with Chiefs, Pirates and Sundowns on like-for-like -like terms. We see ourselves competing for trophies, for sure, um, but not for the hearts and minds of the support base that they have because they have that very strong support base. That's still a challenge that's open to our club that we need to find um, a home that really embraces us because as much as we've played out of Attridgeville these last 20 years, I don't think Attridgeville has really taken to us um, the way that we, we hoped, the, the way that we felt um, our 12 trophies would warrant. And, you know, that, that having become such a successful club in the PSL, we thought we would have a more passionate following. We play in the heart of Attridgeville, in the middle of the, of, of the of Attridgeville, um, in, you know, and we have, but we haven't been able to win those hearts and minds. So for us, we've got different types of challenges to, to ponder and to try and see if there are communities where perhaps we could penetrate even at a small level, but really get a community to get behind us. Um, so relocation is something that we um, are seriously contemplating. Um, but for the rest, we want to punch above our weight in the league and um, finish as high as we can without necessarily being, you know, devastated that we're not um, winning league championships. So you spoke about wanting to punch above where you currently are at the moment. And I'm sure that's a target for a lot of teams within the South African League. Uh, but you once said Pizzo Mosimane, who's been a, um, a guest on our show as well. You've worked with him. What was it like working with a manager like that? And did you actually believe that he had the potential to win three CAF, CAF uh, championships as well? Yeah, look, I, I was very fortunate that um, in my formative time at the club, I, I encountered Pizza early on. So I was still making my own way in the game. Um, I hadn't had a very good relationship with Bruce Robola, who was the coach. Um, and before Pizzo. And, um, you know, it was one of those situations where there was this young, aspiring, hungry, ambitious, passionate, um, obsessed, uh, you know, development coach in the club. And I had come from amateur development myself. So I found it very comfort comfortable to work with Pizzo. And um, I related to his vision and what he wanted to do and how he wanted to build it. And, you know, every time I would go overseas, he'd make me go to these crazy bookshops and bring him, you know, seemingly arbitrary books about baseball coaches and basketball legends. And, you know, he would make me bring back these random books. And only after a while, I would start to see that, you know, Pizza wanted to cover all bases of, of, of coaching and he wanted to take in you know, all the different styles and, and success stories in and around coaching, whether it was football, whether it was basketball, whether it was baseball, whether it was American football, um, it, it didn't matter. He wanted to absorb uh, the best. Um, when the, the board gave him a chance as caretaker, uh, a coach, um, you know, he wasn't given the job outright. He was made a caretaker coach uh, midway through a season. And... His impact was tremendous, and we finished second that year. Um, he took us from really 12th or 13th place on the log up to second. And you could see straight away, here's someone with coaching talent. Um, there was never any question that Pito was going to go on to higher things. And um, when we lost him to Bafana in 2006, it was a big loss to the club. But in fairness, that secondment um, of him to Carlos Alberto Pereira's team uh, changed Pizzo and took him from being potentially great to actually um, living living it. Um, because those uh, four years um, that he worked with Carlos, um, the people he encountered, the courses that he went on, the live coaching that he witnessed each and every day, um, the man management, the different styles, and traveling around um, with Carlos Alberto on friendlies, on scouting missions, on Pizzo really absorbed intellectual capital, the likes of which no other South African coach could do. The closest could come to him was Stuart Baxter in terms of Stuart's um, exposure overseas. And maybe now you could look at Benny and say that, you know, with Benny's um, track record in playing and, and his, the access to 
personalities and and intellectual capital that he has on a direct basis, whether it's a Jose Mourinho, uh, uh, you know, um, he's 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 put himself in a bracket where he can become a really special coach. Um, because without that international exposure, without that international flavor, without the most modern trends, and without spending time with the best practitioners in the game, and those are in Europe right now, if you don't do that then you can't get to the level that Pizzo is. Um, you can get some of the way there, and you might even be able to get there for a little bit, but to stay there, to fight a fight like Pizzo's fighting with pyramids and Zamalek in Egypt, um, it's, that's, that's a tough space to be. And um, it's a very exclusive club that can go and play in that space and um, put up with the environment, the people, the language, the culture, um, the hostility, the passion of the Egyptian people is uh, very high for their football. You know, we as South Africans think that we're very passionate about football, but you only have to go to an Egyptian derby to realize that um, we're very friendly and nice, nice, but overseas, um, it's cutthroat do or die business and there's half a country that's relying on pizza to deliver uh, and there's half a country that completely despises him <laughs> and uh, it's a tough space to be eh? it's a it's a pretty unforgiving job you know even when you're successful and you've won back-to-back -back champions leagues exactly um, exactly you know when i talk to you stan i know you're a proud owner i'm oh, sorry proud ceo of supersport you, you're a proud South African. You're passionate about Fofana. Um, but at the um, return Champions League group game between Sundowns and Al Ali, um, there was a disruption to the Al Ali team bus arriving at the stadium. Uh, the club releasing a statement saying that Sundowns fans allegedly stopped the bus from getting there. Pizzo having to go out and actually help reroute and organize a way for um, people to go in. We know Pizzo had issues on his return to Sundowns last year, where there was some pretty, I think we'll all agree, disgraceful treatment he was given by the fans. Unsavory treatment, yes. I think, again, you know, we'll all agree with that. But Stan, from your perspective, you're, you know, somebody who's deeply involved in South African football. Um, when you view what happened at the stadium and some of the treatment Pizzo's got in the past from Sundowns fans, in inverted commas, because um, we're not here to tie everyone with the same brush, um, what are your what are your observations? How do you how do you look at those those, those unsavory incidents? Yeah, I think it's football, and we're in the entertainment business. Um, I think sometimes people make a lot, or the media sometimes stirs those types of pots. Um, yeah, Pizzo, you know, he's parted ways with Sundowns. I don't think anyone can take away what they achieve together as an organization and an individual. Um, yes, it's bitter when a coach leaves you. It's bitter. I, don't, I can't lie to you and say when the coach leaves me, you know, that I'm thinking to myself, I hope he does well um, at his next job. You know, when a coach uh, leaves you, especially in, in, in difficult circumstances, there's, there's that rivalry on an individual personal level. Um, and it's like that if, if, you, if you sack a coach, the first club he wants to beat and his next job is you because he wants to show you, you know, you were wrong. So there's, there's always going to be that hostility. I think um, that just needs to be managed. I think that with Pizza and Sundown, it was a special love affair. And so the divorce, um, sometimes there's still a lot of passion left. Um, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Pizza lived at Sundown's uh, uh, job and he poured his heart and soul into it and in his uh, mind he built them to be the powerhouse that you know we, we, you know to really establish themselves as the strong powerhouse he feels he played a very strong part in that um, and he's that kind of personality that doesn't leave you wondering because it's not a moderate you know Keitano Tembo he, would, he won't fight with people he's in his own space and He's not in your face. Pizzo, is a, that's his character. That's what makes him Pizzo. He's in your face. He's stirring you up. He's emotional. I played nearly first to cut with Pizzo in the tunnel because he saw, you know, red flags 
uh, because he wasn't happy about what dugout we were sitting in and he wanted to come to blows with me and a few people that he worked with for many years. Um, but after the game, we still hug and we're still friends and we're still brothers and we still have coffee every time he comes to South Africa, he looks me up and we see each other. In football, um, some of that rivalry, we deal with it and we understand it's part of the game and it fuels passion and, 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 and excitement. And as long as it's done with the level of dignity and respect, um, I think that it's nice to have competitive rivalry. When you go too far, um, in, in either, uh, um, you know, uh, reactions or behavior or aggression or overt uh, hostility, then that's too far. And that's not what we in the game, we want to have rivalry. We want to have a little chirp here and there. We want to have a fight. We were, you know, handbags from 10 paces, football, footballers are rolling around and diving around, getting each other into trouble. This is the nature of the game. But after the whistle, we all take it on the chin. We won, we lost, we drew, whatever happened, uh, we move on. But uh, sometimes with the media, these things can get stirred up. So now it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because when sundowns go over to Egypt, they're going to get it back tenfold. And so it's going to become a thing now that the, that the two of them, when they're competing with each other, are going to be hostile with each other unnecessarily because that's not what we want in a game. We don't want um, fans ambushing buses or targeting team buses or making players feel intimidated. Players are young people, young kids, even young men, 30 years old with families. They're just starting out with young kids at home. Uh, some of them 20 years old, they're young kids themselves. They're just footballers. They're not there to, to um, be subject to unreasonable hostility, to unreasonable aggression, to unreasonable um, a, a, a way in or out of the stadium. That's not, that's not a fair play. And um, that's not healthy for the game. So, you know, I hope that the rivalry that is there, um, I think the rivalry between Al Ahli and Sundowns is fantastic for soccer and fantastic for sports. Um, I think it'll bring out the best in sundowns um, and, and, and we want them to prevail. We want them to fly the South African flag high and we want them to, to win more gold stars and uh, force pizza to spend more money in Egypt and do stuff like that. Um, but we don't want it to descend into a mindless um, uh, hatred without an um, institutional memory that Pizza was a special son of the sundowns family. And um, knowing uh, Dr. Mutsepi uh, as I do, um, and working with his uh, son, Kloppi, as I have, um, I can tell you that they hold the way things are done, um, sportsmanship and uh, fair play, and, uh, you know, at the highest level. And they certainly won't want that Sundowns brand um, gets dragged into petty rivalry, petty squabbles. We want high-level uh, uh, um, uh, competition. We want high-level rivalry. This is good for the game. When crowds come back and things like that, um, we want to have widespread support and, and we want our fans to get behind our teams on the continental competitions. And we want our players to be able to go into hostile environments like Egypt and muscle out a win now and make sure you go to the next round and do the things that, that need to be done um, for Sundowns to advance because if they are advancing and they're overcoming the Egyptians, this is good for the PSL. This is good for our players who are competing against Sundowns players week in, week out. Um, this is how we raise the bar um, for, for the standard in, in the PSL and that will be beneficial for South African football. Mr. Matthews, you've been... Uh fantastic with your time and your insight from a CEO's perspective, but also of how well intertwined you are into the Supersport Club and the PSL fraternity. Our, our final question to you, there's been so much speculation and you've touched on this um, at different points. The African Super League and the creation of an African Super League what are your thoughts on that? And do you think it's something that is beneficial for African clubs, smaller clubs, or, and for the continent? 
it's very difficult to comment about it um, because in any official capacity that I serve, whether CEO of Supersport United, whether it be um, executive member of the PSL um, in my former role as an executive member of, of SAFA, um, I never ever had it put across my desk about a, a Super League. So, you know, it, the speculation and the stuff that, 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 that you hear, it's difficult to comment on officially because there's never been an official point that has said, um, as an individual administrator or as a collective, to say, examine this, evaluate this. What do you think of this? This is what we're planning. This is what we're doing. So, I, I definitely can't comment about 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 a super league. Um, we saw what happened in Europe um, when when that was touted, and I think that those types of 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 things bring a lot of complexity because on what basis do you do you select um you know what's the basis for the for the selection is it just the three biggest clubs or four biggest clubs or two biggest clubs or whatever number of clubs is it by um uh, popularity by following is yeah. it by track, is that exclusive. yeah is, you know is it, is it is it what we've done over the last five years um over the last uh 10 years um, is it over the, is it, uh, you know, is it, um, you know, is it trophies one? Is it, uh, you know, what, 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 what's the criteria? So now if we don't have bums on seats, actually in stadiums supporting teams, we don't have a product. COVID has shown us that. The, 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 the audience ratings on television have plunged without crowds. People don't want to see 3D advertising and empty stands on the television when they turn it on. They want to see bums on seats, cheering fans, passionate people that make them think, ooh, uh, we must go to the next game and be part of that experience. And we're losing a little bit of that fan culture. And COVID's now pushed that over the edge because now people have got used to for two years, they haven't come to the stadium. So we're going to have to grab this opportunity of reopening um, with a lot of vigor as football clubs. Certainly as Supersport United, we are doing a lot of introspection and saying, if the fans of Attridgeville don't get behind us now, after COVID, for sure we're going to be looking for a new home base in a community where we believe um, we can grow and be embraced and get support, not a lot. I'm quite happy to get five, six thousand uh, people to a game, um, but you know, in a smaller stadium, that really can work, and um, and can create a beautiful atmosphere, uh, which is half the battle that you want. Players will play better when they're playing in front of people under a little bit of pressure, with a bit of edge, knowing they need to give their best, you know, because someone's going to be shouting at them, "Hey." You know, run back. What are you doing? You know, the soccer is a great leveler. And what keeps you honest is the fans. And um, I, I have to come yeah. here because um, this is the second time you've said it during our interview is that you guys are assessing your options and whether you want to stay where you currently are. Which markets, which cities, which towns, which stadiums would you be open to, to relocating the club to? I, I think that's a process. We, we would be happy to look at that process. Um, we've, we've looked at Davyton at Sinaba Stadium, um, which is a nice small stadium in the heart of a township um, where we think we could get some good support. Highlands Park went into Makulong and they made that Makulong place a nice little fortress for them. So it can be done. Um, there's one or two municipalities that are putting in smaller stadiums as we speak. Um, you know, even in Pretoria, the Caledonian Stadium would be very interesting for us. Um, we, would, we would actually grab an opportunity to go back like when I started. When I started in 1999, 2000, we played out of Caledonia. And it was a small five, 6,000 seater. If you got three, 4,000 students from TUT, it, it dropped. It was hostile. And it wasn't easy for teams to come and beat us. So I believe that if we could get that right, if we could get a little Caledonian stadium, a little Sinaba stadium, something like that, in the heart of a township, or in Caledonian's uh, case, it's right in the, in, in the inner city hub. People can walk down to the stadium, they don't need public transport or anything like that. 
just from that, you know, that Hatfield and inner city area, we believe we'll, we'd be able to fill Caledonian. And then, you know, I think that's just a better atmosphere, bring better out of the players and, and give the club a boost, um, you know, in wanting to get back into the top four in the league by having a, a formidable home ground where not many teams can come in and get points off us. Stanley, thank you for being so generous with your time. The insight was absolutely amazing. Um, Unbelievable insight, honestly. You're, you're yeah. welcome around Albry anytime. Um, <laughs> Courtney's will be in overcast conditions. Mine will be in the hottest <laughs> you can ever find. So you'll be sweating and you'll need something cold to cool you down. If it's a cool drink or something stronger, we can organize that for you. Um, but what a pleasure getting your insight. And we certainly wish you and Supersport all the best with your ambitions this season and beyond. An absolute pleasure um, just spending some time with you today. Thank you. If we, if we win the Ned Bank, I'll bring the trophy on the show. I wish all the best to Supersport United. It's in a good guardianship under your, your care and your support structure. So well done. And may all the goodness continue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on the show and look forward to coming on again. Thank you.